point and interpret it as sound. In equilibrium, I want you to think of orientation. sound waves or vibrations, and they'll also move in response to movement of your head. And as we look at the ear, those movements are as sound body. So we need to talk a little bit about basic here. Way most people think of sine wave function. Some may be modulus sine wave, you know, wave than a sine wave. Um, sound waves don't look like or like areas of high air density. So if we were to have, you know, a speaker or your lecturer in front of you talking, um, something would cause air molecules to be compressed. And as these air molecules are being compressed, they want to expand. And they expand and push and form another area of compression. That second area of compression forms expands and forms another area of compression. So when we look at sound waves, it's not necessarily you know, a high number of sound waves on the ocean. It's a compression wave moving through the air that can be modeled with a sine function. Um, we need to talk briefly about um, the sine function, though, so we can make sense of the subsequent slide. When we think of amplitude of a wave, that's going to be the up-down height. When we think of uh, frequency, frequency is the inverse of the wavelength. And typically, to get frequency, we're going to count the number of peaks that go by in a given second. So for a sound wave purpose, uh, the number of compression waves that hit you within a second determines the frequency. You can think of it as compression waves per second when we think of frequency. So, when we think of pitch, the pitch of a noise, a high pitch noise versus a low pitch noise, is going to be determined by that frequency. How quickly are those compression waves hitting you? Um, high frequency noises have a high pitch, low frequency noises have a low sounding pitch to them. And when we think of frequency, it's going to be measured in a unit called hertz. Um, when we think of hertz, that's going to be an event per second. So the, when we think of human hearing, the low end of the spectrum is 20 hertz. The high end of the spectrum is 20,000 hertz. Uh, most people in this room probably can't hear 20,000 hertz anymore. Um, there's a lot of hearing damage that's been occurring in your generation due to earbuds being cranked too loud. Uh, and when we think of pitch and frequency, those high frequency noises are typically the first ones to go. When we look at hearing loss, we're going to have a lot of hearing loss, typically going in within the range of most human speech. When we think of regular human speech, that's going to be 1,500 to 5,000 hertz. And then when we look at hu hearing loss, that's going to be overlapping with that range of human speech. Now, when we think of loudness, we measure how loud a noise is with a unit called decibels. Um, that, and that's just a logarithmic scale. And when we think of a logarithmic scale, I want you to think of the Fukushima scale for tornadoes, the Richter scale for earthquakes, the pH scale for hydrogen ion concentration. When you have one change of a unit, that's a tenfold change in power. When you look at an 80 decibel noise versus a 90 decibel noise, it's a fluctuation in next to you. So when we look at that loudness, that loudness is determined by the amplitude, how the wave is going up and down in a sine function. When we think of loudness in terms of it being a how complex are the molecules? If they're high 
high compressed, there's a higher amplitude, and the noise is interpreted as a louder noise. So, when we look at that, I personally am a big fan of the, the name Oracle. Um, in ancient times, um, an oracle was somebody that you really wanted to listen to. Typically, they were giving you a word from God. Um, and that root word, it's the same root word that's used to name our outer ear, the oracle. When we look at the outer ear, we're going to have the outer ear function to take sound waves, those compression waves of air molecules, and funnel the compression waves of air molecules into the external auditory meatus, sometimes referred to as the auditory canal, and those compression waves are going to hit the tympanic membrane. Um, timpani is a root word for drum, and for those of you that are band geeks or bandies back in the day, uh, the timpani in orchestra are giant copper drums. When we think of the tympanic membrane, it is the ear drum. And those compression waves will hit the eardrum, and our eardrum is a very large, I like to say relatively large membrane. And that relatively large membrane will then have its vibrations concentrated by the auditory ossicles to a much smaller surface area. And the stapes will press against a much smaller membrane called the oval window. And from the oval window, those vibrations will travel through the vestibule into the cochlea be interpreted as sound waves as they activate nerves to trigger action potentials. As the oval window presses in, there'll be some pressure buildup. We'll talk about the mechanisms to release that pressure buildup in subsequent slides. So let's look at our outer ear. Within our outer ear, we have uh, many different parts. And if you become um, an ear doctor, we'll go through all of those parts and you'll have to commit, commit them all to memory. The parts that we are asking you to know for lab purposes include the oracle, and I believe we also included the lobule and external acoustic meatus, or external auditory meatus, um, as your learning objectives for lab. Notably, a uh, lobule is a classic genetic test, um, whether it's or activities that you typically will do with your students, or excuse me, do with your classmates when you're covering Mendelian genetics. Now, as we look at the external auditory meatus, this tube is designed to have sound waves channeled. We don't want bugs, we don't want fingers, we don't want water. So we're going to have we're going to have some mechanisms in the external auditory meatus to keep bugs out. We're going to have guard hairs, sometimes referred to as vibrissae. And those vibrissae keep larger objects out of your ear. Um, as we age, vibrissae become more pronounced. We're also going to have a lot of earwax or crewmen. Crewmen is a modified sebum or a modified sebaceous sec secretion. We find that a little bit of crewmen or earwax is beneficial. It helps to waterproof the ear, it helps to waterproof the tympanic membrane, and helps make it so that water will drain out we have too much earwax or too much crewmen build up in our ear. That's referred to as impacted crewmen. Um, and that impacted crewmen can be kind of inhibitory because it blocks the transmission waves to the tympanic membrane. If we have a normal, healthy ear with homeostasis, every once in a while, the crewmen will build up to a thick, scaly lump and then flake out and fall out of the external auditory meatus, and there'll be a chunk of earwax that falls out of your ear. Some people are a little bit more waxy than other people. Um, the Guinness Book of World Records states that the person who makes the most earwax has to clean three times a day. And it, it was a bunch of it was pretty nasty. It reminded me of Shrek when he made his earwax candles. Move on to the middle ear. When we look at the dividing line between the external ear and the middle ear is the tympanic membrane. For lab purposes, when Ms. Laundress and I were talking about it, we um, intentionally did not categorize the tympanic membrane as part of the external or part of the middle ear. Some textbooks will call it part of the middle ear. Some textbooks call it part of the external ear. It's really the dividing line between the two. 
And as we look at that middle ear, it begins after or at the tympanic membrane. When we think of our tympanic membrane, it's going to be approximately one centimeter in diameter or approximately three square centimeters in surface area. And this tympanic membrane can vibrate back and forth in response to those compression waves that are hitting as the air molecules are funneled through the external auditory nucleus. As we look at the tympanic membrane, it's going to be continuous with some auditory ossicles, the malocinchus and stapes, and then there's going to be some hollow spaces in here. These hollow spaces are air cells that the, the auditory ossicles are going to be within, referred to as the tympanic air cells. And these are mastoid air cells, I should say. Um, they're next to the mastoid process, um, hence the namesake. And as we look at these auditory ossicles, the Latin name is malus inches and stapes. Malus is mallet in Latin. Incus is uh, the Latin term for anvil. And stapes is the Latin term for stirrup. So the common English names are the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Um, those common English names were not on your lab objective sheets. Then we have the eustachian tube. Eustachian tube is the old school name that they used. If you notice in your lab manual, the eustachian tube was not present, that term. Um, but for the sake of connecting the new term to the old term, we're going to include eustachian tube. The auditory tube, sometimes also referred to as the Pharyngotympanic tube is going to connect our middle ear with the nasal cavity. So here we have the auditory tube in an adult. Here is the auditory tube in an infant. And as we look at that auditory tube, the purpose of the auditory tube is to equalize air pressure. You can see it in an airplane if you swim like the deep end of a swimming pool, 10 feet deep of water, or maybe when driving up and down mountains, you can feel pain build up in your head. And that pain build up in your head is unequalized pressure and the middle ear. So think about those times you've been on an airplane. You, you're taking off, you go up, 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 up. You get some pain in your ear, so you plug it up, you blow to equalize your pressure, and all of a sudden, you can feel normal. The reason the hearing is altered at the unequalized is because that tympanic membrane can't. When there's un one side or on both sides of the tympanic membrane, the tympanic membrane is either pushed in or forced out and can't vibrate freely. So we can't turn those sound waves into action potential so clearly. Um, one of the things that happens with the tympanic membrane as it vibrates is that it's going to take that vibration and transfer it to the malus. And then the malus will take the vibration and transmit it. And the incus will take that vibration and transmit it to the stapes. And from the stapes, we'll take that vibration and transmit it to the oval window, which is a small membrane that marks the beginning of the inner ear. We have two holes in our middle ear that help to regulate the tympanic membrane and the auditory ossicles. Those muscles are referred to as the stapeus and the tensor tympani. And these muscles can contract, help muffle sounds, help minimize how much our eardrum will vibrate so that we can regulate how we perceive loud noises. Um, any discussion of the middle ear would be incomplete if we didn't talk about ear infections. An ear infection is technically Noted, or technically known as otis media. Um, it refers to the and are so are really prone to getting a lot of middle ear infections because their auditory tube is nearly horizontal. They don't have the drainage out of their middle ear. As we age, the curvature of the auditory tube changes with more of a pitch, steeper angle to our auditory tube, and we can more effectively lose the fluid that builds up in our middle ear, and we're less likely to get those very painful otis media or ear infections. 
Um, I was talking to some mothers who had a bunch of kids and they got ear infections all the time. Um, classic to look for with the optoscope when you look at the ear is if you can look in the person's ear with the scope and see the auditory ossicles, they don't have an ear infection. But as that ear infection is twisting, fluid builds up in the middle ear, and typically bacterial form in that blocks the view of the auditory ossicles. So when a doctor is looking in the middle ear, or looking in the ear, they're trying to see if they can or cannot see the auditory ossicles. If they can't see the auditory ossicles, there's a pretty good chance there's a bunch of fluid and an infection of the middle ear. Um, for young children that are prone to very heavy middle ear infections, a lot of times there'll be tubes put within the eardrum. Um, those tubes are going to be inserted as the surgeon will lance the tympanic membrane and then take a small tube and insert it within the tympanic membrane. Um, that tube allows for increased drainage and increased utilization so that child typically won't experience as much pain or as many middle ear infections. And there's a nice side benefit of having those tubes in your middle ear, or tubes in the tympanic membrane. Um, that child can then blow bubbles out of their ear. If they go to the swimming pool and plug their nose and push hard, when they push hard, air travels through the auditory tube to the middle ear, and then the air will continue traveling through the tympanic membrane, and the bubbles come out of their ears. That's not you put tubes. So let's talk about the inner ear. When we look at our inner ear, it's going to be contained with the bony labyrinth of the temporal bone. And this bony labyrinth is just a nice way of saying that there's a bunch of hollow spaces. And these hollow spaces are going to contain the vestibule, the cochlea, and the semicircular canals. And these hollow spaces have some liquids in them. These liquids are viscous. We're going to need to push on them with a lot of pressure. They're known as the endolymph and the perilymph. The endolymph of the two is the more serous of the two, so it's the less viscous. The perilymph is the more viscous of the two. And within these cavities, we can see those two fluid membranes, and we can see all of the tubes associated with the middle ear, or excuse me, the inner ear, as those vibrations travel through the tube, those vibrations are going to be interpreted as action potentials. Here on the right side of our figure, we have the cochlea. This cochlea um, is our organ of hearing. It's so named because it resembles a seashell. Cochlea is a Latin word for shell. Um, you can still see this root word in common English if you ever get conch fritters at... Um, a seafood market. Within our inner ear, there is going to be three fluid-filled chambers. Those fluid-filled chambers are going to have the two fluids, the endolymph and the perilymph within them. So let's first look at the scala vestibuli. Our scala vestibuli <coughs> is located right here. So it's going to be analogous to that part of our figure. Our scala vestibuli is the superior chamber filled with perilymph, and it begins directly at the oval window. So the oval window is going to transmit its vibrations directly to this fluid-filled chamber. And then from the scala vestibuli, we're going to have the scala media. The scala media is that medial chamber, and here, this figure is blue. The scala media is going to be filled with endolymph, and the scala media is going to contain the spiral organ, or organ of cordy. This is the actual organ that we use to generate our sense of hearing. We'll talk about that organ on the next PowerPoint slide. And then as we're going to have those vibrations traveling through the inner ear, we're going to have a pressure relief valve. So we'll push in on the oval window. The vibrations will travel through the scala vestibuli, then to the scala media, and then the scala tympani are going to continue containing those pressure waves, and the pressure will be relieved at the round window. As we look at the spiral organ, our spiral organ is one of the more interesting sensory organs in the body. It's going to have little tiny hair cells with mechanically gated ion channels. 
and these mechanically gated ion channels will open and close as the, the hairs vibrate within our inner ear. Those microvilli are referred to as stereocilia. Stereocilia because we have a left-right pairing, and we can use those stereocilia to triangulate where the sound is coming from, to figure out where that noise is coming from as we're listening to it. There's a small membrane on top of the stereocilia called the tectoral membrane, and this is the membrane that receives those pressure waves. As that tectoral membrane vibrates inside of the cochlea, that tectoral membrane is going to cause the hairs attached to it to move back and forth. We have two groups of hairs associated with the tectoral membrane. We have the inner hair cells, which stand alone, and then we have the outer hair cells, which are kind of in a group. Those outer hair cells in this electron micrograph are shown as multiple rows of hairs, and the inner hair cells are a single row of hairs. And as we look at the inner hair cells, I want you to focus primarily on inner hair cells being used for hearing. Outer hair cells are going to be used for precision. So we use our inner hair cells just to get that rough signal transmission, to take a vibration into a sound wave. The outer hair cells, because of the physical orientation, they're spread out more. And because they're spread out more, they allow for us to perilymph, that vibration is going to have small nuances associated with a better, uh, better ability to interpret pitch and precisely locate what that sound is. Let's focus on the tympanic membrane in a little bit more detail. This is an oversimplification, but I love this diagram from your textbook. We have the tympanic membrane right here, and then we have the auditory ossicles, that Malosynchus and stapes, and that tympanic membrane is going to take a compression wave of air molecules, which really isn't that much of a compression wave. When we think of sound waves hitting us, most of the time we don't even feel it. We can pick it up with our tympanic membrane in our ears, but think of the pressure receptors in your body. Those sound waves don't generate a lot of pressure. I mean, occasionally, if you're standing in front of a slip stop over, but most of the time, when you're talking to a human being, you don't feel the vibrations on your face. So when we look at the ear, the ear, in particular the middle ear, functions to take a relatively weak vibration and concentrate it so that we can perceive that weak vibration as it vibrates through relatively viscous fluids. So when we look at the tympanic membrane relative to the oval window, that oval window is 1 18th of the surface area of the tympanic membrane. In other words, the oval window allows for us to increase the pressure wave 18 times or 18 fold. And that means that that pressure wave can actually travel effectively through the cochlea. Now, if we push in on one part of the inner ear, we can think of the inner ear as just a giant water balloon. If you push in on one part of the water balloon, a different part of the water balloon needs to swell out to equal that pressure. So when we push in on the oval window, the round window will bulge out to equalize the fluid pressure within the inner ear. Let's go to that spiral organ. As we're looking at the hairs within our inner ear, the hairs within the cochlea, those hairs can vibrate very frequently. We, we can perceive a sound that, at a frequency of 20 hertz. That means that hair is oscillating back and forth or 20 times per second. If we perceive a sound that's at 20,000 hertz, that means the hair is oscillating back and forth 20,000 times per second. So these things are oscillating either relatively slowly or relatively As that tectoral membrane will oscillate back and forth, it's going to move the secondary membrane referred to as the basilar membrane. And these hair cells oscillate with those membranes. Now within the inner ear 
Um, we have a different ionic environment compared to the extracellular fluid of the nervous system or the extracellular fluid of the skeletal muscle system. Um, we're going to have very high concentrations of potassium ions in the fluid of the inner ear. So they, um, there's a rare disease referred to as Meniere's disease, and this is, results from individuals having inappropriate potassium concentrations in the fluid of their inner ear, and this causes them to lose to maintain equilibrium. Oftentimes they get dizzy and will throw up a lot, or have a lot of nausea, associated with this potassium imbalance of the inner ear. As we're looking at these stereocilia, or these hair cells in the inner ear, the outside of the cell is at positive 80 millivolts, the inside is at negative 40 millivolts. So let's focus on those hair cells. We have our tectoral membrane right here as that red line that I'm drawing. And as that tectoral membrane, which is connected to the basilar membrane, oscillates back and forth, we'll have a small tickling or strip of protein that's going to be connected to them. And that protein is going to cause a mechanically gated ion channel to open and close. It's like physically opening and closing a microscopic door. And as we physically open and close that microscopic door, potassium ions can freely move through it. And when we open that channel, here it's closed. Let me clear it for you. You can just barely make out a little line going across. But as we pull the hair away, the hair is pulled away, the door is opened up. As the potassium ions rush in, that is going to depolarize the cell and initiate the action potential. That action potential is going to be sent down the cochlear er nerve and be perceived as sound by our brain. So, let's talk about the physical relationship between noise, or like loudness, and where in the cochlea those vibrations are occurring. Our cochlea um, has a varying thickness. It starts off very wide in the beginning, and as the spiral becomes narrower and narrower. And this influences where in the cochlea those vibrations are going to occur. We typically find that for the variations in pitch, or variations in the loudness or the amplitude of the sound, that very soft noises are going to cause the membrane to very gently oscillate back and forth. Loud noises will cause that membrane to oscillate aggressively. Let's back up a couple slides here. If I'm aggressively oscillating the membrane, I'm going to take a lot of hair cells and open a lot of mechanically gated ion channels. So if I'm shaking that membrane, I'm shaking lots of hair cells, and I'm going to generate lots of individual action potentials from individual hair cells, and we'll perceive that as a loud noise. Now, if it's a quiet noise, we have a weak compression wave. That weak wave shakes the membrane gently, and the gentle shake of the temporal membrane only causes a couple of the hair cells to open their mechanically gated ion channels. So we have fewer action potentials being sent to the brain, and we interpret that as a quieter noise. One of the ways that we have hearing loss is if you are exposed to those very loud noises, you physically shake hair cells. The stereos are physically going to be ripped away from their attachment points within the inner ear, and you can no longer use them to perceive hearing. Let's talk about pitch encoding. Different parts of the cochlea will vibrate for different frequencies of noise, whether it's a high frequency or a low frequency, or a high pitch and a low pitch. So as we look at the basilar membrane, here is the basilar membrane in red, Depending on where it starts to vibrate, we'll interpret that as a different frequency of noise. We can vibrate stereocilia near the beginning of the cochlea, in the middle of the cochlea, or towards the end of the cochlea. So as we're looking at this, at the basal end, we'll have 
low frequent, the membrane is very stiff and narrow, and that's going to be interpreted as high pitch noises. At the distal end, so this farther towards the end, away from the oval window, we have a wider, and that wider opening is going to allow for low frequency noises to vibrate, and we'll interpret that as a low pitch noise. On where we're physically oscillating that membrane, we can interpret that as physically different noises. This is one of the reasons that we can have frequency dependent hearing loss. If you're exposed to frequent high fr frequency noises, you can lose the ability to hear just that high frequency noise because you're only vibrating the stereo cilia associated with that noise. And low frequency cilia aren't going to be vibrating as frequently, or vice versa. If you're frequently exposed to loud, low frequency noises, those low frequency noises will preferentially vibrate stereo cilia in one region of the cochlea and can overuse them and potentially damage them. When we look at hearing loss or deafness, um, there's degrees of deafness. There's a spectrum of deafness. And this is going to be age adjusted. Young people or young children are supposed to have more stereo cilia in their cochlea. They are supposed to have a higher sensitivity for hearing. When hearing is being tested, there's always the age adjustment. As we age, we naturally lose some of our hearing. And as we lose that, our perception or the, the test for what is normal is adjusted. Um, for example, I'm thinking of my father. When, when my father was younger, he had lots and lots of ear infections. And as a young kid, he was declared one third deaf. Um, because he lost one third of his hearing at the very early stage of his life, he was very paranoid about protecting his ears. He wore hearing protection on the lawnmower, whenever he was using power tools. Sometimes he'd wear hearing protection if the car was too loud while he was driving down the highway. And after being super paranoid his entire life, he now has average hearing because he's minimized his hearing loss throughout his lifetime. And everyone else has been in his bracket, has abused their ears, and now they're all on the equal or they're all equally tone deaf, as I like to say. Now, there's two kinds of deafness that occur. We have conduction deafness. This is going to interfere with the physical vibration of the tympanic membrane. Um, we can have a lot of temperature. We have air pressure in the middle ear, or if we have impacted crewmen or too much earwax building up on the outside of the tympanic membrane. We could also have some conduction deafness if we have too many ear infections causing the auditory ossicles to partially fuse together. Ear infections are bad for the malus incus and stapes because they cause the malus incus and stapes to be irritated and the osteoblasts, the bone building cells, will be stimulated in response to that irritation, merging those into partially fusing the auditory ossicles together. That process is referred to as otosclerosis, the stiffening or fusing of the auditory ossicles. Oto is a word referring to ear. We can also have sensio-neuronal deafness or nerve deafness. And this is going to be associated with vibration. This is going to be associated with the inability to action potential. This is probably the most common kind of deafness because it's going to be associated with being exposed to very loud noise. So when we look at the sensor and neuronal deafness, part of it's reversible. Um, you may have at some point in your life been exposed to a really loud noise, or maybe you went to a really loud rock concert, something of that nature. And for the next couple days, it was hard for you to hear. But over a couple days, you were able to regain most of that hearing that you lost. Um, that's good, that we can regrow and regenerate those connections for our stereocilia. But it's an imperfect process as we age. Lose the ability to regenerate our stereo connections and have to form instead, and eventually, progressively, we're going to lose our ability to hear. Let's talk about equilibrium. Look at equilibrium. That's the our sense of balance within our inner ear, and this sense of balance is going to be regulated by the vestibule and by the semicircular canals. Um, there's two kinds of equilibrium. 
those two kinds of equilibrium are regulated by the two different structures, the vestibule and the semicircular canals. With semicircular canals, sometimes referred to as semicircular ducts, it's worth pointing out that the, the three loops are oriented in three different directions that correspond to x, y, and z axes, or an x, y plane, an x, z plane, and a y, z plane, um, for those of you who are interested in three-dimensional geometry. And it's the physical orientation of those semicircular ducts that allows for the semicircular duct to help us maintain dynamic equilibrium, or to detect the changes in formation. Um, one of the reasons why a lot of because their semicircular canals um, don't pick up any movement. When you're just sitting in a car and you're just driving on the highway, it's not like the body's being jostled back and forth. You're not being accelerated or decelerated or changing directions. And as a result of that, your inner ear tells you different you're not moving around. Your eyes can be sending different signals to your brain. And when your eyes and your inner ear have contradictory signals, that can cause car sickness, motion sickness. This can occur, and this is probably the more common version of it. When somebody back seat, you're car sick. And the reason for that is, is you're looking down at the book, and your eyes are saying that you're not moving, because the book relative to your eyeball is stationary. But those semicircular picking up all that movement, and if you have a crazy driver, you know, the juky, you know, going back and forth, and there's lots of acceleration that your inner ear is picking up. And the conflict in signal, the eyes saying you're stationary, the inner ear saying you're moving around like crazy, can cause a lot of people to feel nauseous or sick. Within the vestibule, we have two chambers, an anterior and a posterior, an anterior succule and a posterior urticle. And those two chambers are going to be used for the stationary equilibrium. As we look at that stationary equilibrium, stationary equilibrium is going to be associated with the orientation. You probably can make up and just know I'm lying horizontally, I'm lying on my left side, I'm lying on my right how your body is oriented, even when your body is not moving, is going to be static equilibrium. So we have two methods of regulating equilibrium within our inner ear. We have the stationary equilibrium associated with the vestibule, and we have dynamic equilibrium associated with the semicircular canals or ducts. And we have a review question. This is a hard one, so I'll give you an extra 45 seconds. Stimuli produced by sound waves reach the brain by which pathway? Think of the pathway that the, that compression wave needs to travel in order to reach the brain as an action potential. So does our sound wave start at the cochlear duct? Does it start at the auditory canal? Does it start at the tympanic membrane? You can probably eliminate a couple of your options right off the bat for the stage. Think of a sound wave going to an action We're down to about 15 seconds. Please make sure to get your answers in. So 
So, guys, gals, as we're looking at this process, we can back up several slides here. hit the tympanic membrane. From the tympanic membrane, it hits the auditory ossicles. From there, it's going to go to the vestibule and then the cochlea. And from the cochlea, it's going to go through the cochlear nerve membrane. As we look at the options that we had available to us, the answer was E, auditory canal to tympanic membrane to ossicles, oval window, cochlea, spiral organ, and then the fibers of the cochlear nerve. And as we look at our results, most of you did pretty solid on that one. Our next part of the presentation is on vision. And we are going to do vision on Wednesday, so we're going to call it quits five minutes early today. <laughs> <laughs>